Everyone still looks uncomfortable. Perhaps they all remember that old saying, power corrupts. Welcome to Second Officer Slog, episode 17. I'm your host, M. With me is a regular co-host, Jackson. Hello. And we are here to talk about the end of Star Trek Discovery. It's been cancelled. We all knew this would happen. <laughs> Imagine the dark timeline in which this is actually what we are talking about. I'd be so sad. I'd be so fucking God, sad. what if it was a fucking network show and it just... Oh. oh it would have been bad. No, this is the season uh, one, chapter one, full finale, television stupid. But this episode's fantastic, so we're very excited. No Jackson. one's watched the Orville, don't even... <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> Look, so uh, that bit last week where I asked you about it and you were just baffled for like 30 seconds is maybe the funniest <laughs> thing we've ever recorded to me personally. So every I time I really think about it, I laugh. The ability to like, with... a. Uh, like a perfectly phrased hosting question that doesn't give itself away to completely wrong foot me and just leave me this completely like blah, blah 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 and Hugh Grant for like a full 30 seconds. <laughs> Makes you feel very powerful. So me and my partner watched Star Trek 6 The Undiscovered Country this weekend. And that's relevant because this episode is basically like the beginnings of the stuff that's in Star Trek 6 The Undiscovered Country. So if you liked Discovery, you should go watch that movie because it's really good. It is. Uh, the, you know, it's not like the greatest movie in the world, but there, and it drags in the middle, but it's got really good shit in it. Yep. Jackson, it's we should just talk shot, about the episode, It's also shot on the TNG sets, and you were sending me clips, it's very funny. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, if you know the, G and, the TNG sets well, like, you've watched all of TNG, and you know that it's shot there, like, ev like there are just entire scenes that are like, that's just the transporter room, that's just engineering. You, you just redressed engineering poorly! <laughs> It's very funny. It looks like a very cheap movie, but I have very much affection for it. I will go back and rewatch it at some point. I'll do a rewatch of those movies. Yep. So let's just get into it. We have a couple questions. We'll get to them at the end. Um. Yes. If for some reason you haven't listened to this episode, or you haven't watched the episode and you're not going to listen to this, uh, come catch up for one because man, it's good. But come back next month for the real, our real like full book club episodes because we are covering the first Discovery book which is called Desperate Hours by David Mack, and it will be great, I'm sure. And it's about uh, the Shenzo and Burnham when she's first officer and all of that stuff. So I'm very excited for that. Please check out that because uh, we're excited to read it. I'm going to start that book after we record this podcast. Yep. I am also very excited. I have to play a video game first, but then I can start that book and I'm yes. I'm very ready. Um, also, Jax we've, we've been... Um, oh, no, one ahead. last housekeeping bit as we've been saying uh, about the Kelvinverse episodes that are coming up. That is not true. Yeah, um, no. So, so we expected, we were like, oh, like they pushed, like, they're probably like rushing to get production done. Discovery is probably not actually back until like late January or like even February or March. And no, it comes back January 7th. So we don't have any time to do those. Yes. We are going to be doing the uh, Kelvin Vest books after Discovery season one. There'll be some point. Yes. There will be, there will be a lot of downtime at that point because they said the earliest they could ever hope to get season two off the ground is early 2019. So. Whew. So yes, it's going to be a long while, um, but... Oh, you mean it's going to be a long road? I uh, guess. But our time will finally be here in 2019. <laughs> the year of the PS3. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this episode is called Into the Forest We Go. I go. Fuck! <laughs> Owned! Owned! I was trying to get like a very nice, sweet segue there, and instead what happened is I was summarily hoisted. <laughs> You know. It is called Into the Forest I Go. It is written by Erica Erica Lippold? Erica Lippold. Yeah, Lippold. Yep. And uh, Bo Young Kim. It is directed by Chris Byrne. Episode 9 of Season 1 aired on the 12th of November 2017. These are the details. Uh, it doesn't have the year, but it continues on from where it was in 20... Um, well, when is the series set? I keep forgetting every time, but it's like it's ten years before the original series, so it'd be twenty. Yes, yeah, so that would be twenty three fifty five or twenty two fifty five. Sorry. Yes, twenty two fifty five. Right, fifty five fifty six somewhere in there. I have to always adjust uh, for the um, 
you know, the 300 years from the yeah. air date of the original series. Yes. Well, no, I always think, oh, 23, that's the Star Trek century. <laughs> yes, no, it's not. Not here, not now. Not here, not now. Um, and Trek lot, in our time. A lot happens. We'll do a quick summary in case you haven't watched it or are coming back to this podcast years from now. So... The Povins did a dumb thing. They done goofed and they decided to message the Klingons and the Starfleet and be like, come to Pavo. We'll talk out your differences. You can be best friends. And the sarcophagus ship of the dead received that. And Cole was like, no, let's go fuck them up. We can't have these people hailing us. How dare they? Uh, and thus they are coming. And the Discovery decides against orders that they are going to stay here and protect the Povins. Uh, more specifically, they're going to tell Starfleet they're heading back to the Starbase at warp, and then when necessary, they're going to jump back to Pavo when the Klingons show up and fight them. Uh, to do that, they need to be able to get to the cloak, because the cloak is really messing up everybody's day, and they decide that there's a way to do that. They can beam aboard as the ship decloaks, because the shields and the weapons are not on while it's cloaking. So there's a moment where they can beam someone aboard, and they're going to beam aboard uh, Commander Burnham and uh, Tyler, Lieutenant Tyler, whatever. And they're going to plant uh, two sensor beacons there that will allow them to, like, track the ship while it's cloaked. But to do that, they need multiple points of data, which means that Samus has to make 133 jumps uh, in rapid succession to plot out all the various, like, readings of those sensors. And once that happens, they can create a map that allow them to find the ship and, like, go around the cloak and they will have defeated cloaking technology. All of this happens. They beam aboard. They find Lieutenant or Admiral Cornwall there. Uh, and they go to rescue her, and they see Laurel, and Ash Tyler freaks out and has, like, a PTSD thing. And so Burnham has to go to the bridge alone to plant the second beacon, and there she meets Cole, because they need a distraction so the Klingon ship doesn't warp away as Discovery is doing. It's, like, multiple jumps to get all of those readings. Uh, and she fights Cole hand-to-hand and takes back the, uh, the comm badge of Captain Giorgio. And every, the day is saved, everyone's beamed off, including Laurel, who grabs onto Ash Tyler as the beam out is happening. Um, and then uh, they have all of that data plotted, and what that means is they can fuck up that ship, and they do. And the sarcophagus ship and Cole and all of those people are dead. The Klingon War is over. No, not really. But <laughs> the day is saved for now. The Povins apparently are not owned until the next Klingon ship shows up, I guess. Uh Lieutenant Stamets is, like, totally wrecked from all these jumps and is like, no uh, no more, I can't do any more jumps. I need to have Starfleet's best doctors take a look at me because this is clearly, like, messing with my brain. Um, and he talks to Lorca and Lorca's like, that's okay, I, I, we'll just warp back to Starbase. And he's like, no, for you, Captain, I'll do one last jump. I'll get us back to the Starbase and then I, we can all relax and have a nice debrief and go on shore leave and whatever we do. So he goes to do that last jump, and then Lorca in the command console hits a button, and it's like Lorca override, and the warp happen or the jump happens, but the jump goes really weird, and they end up in a space they can't identify, where they're surrounded by Klingon wreckage, and they don't know where they are, and there's no star base to be found, and Stamets' brain breaks, and his eyes cloud over as he collapses and goes into shock. And Lorca's like, where are we? And Saru's like, oh, we, I don't know. We are lost in space. No, that's a different show. That's a different but show. Yes. that's where we are as this episode ends. Also, Ash Tyler's very sad. And Lorel is like, don't worry, I'll protect you. Yes. I because like... Ash Tyler is clearly a Klingon. <laughs> Ash Tyler is, uh, yes. So uh, a lot of things happen in this episode. First of which is uh, confirmed Ash Tyler, a Klingon. I mean, people hasn't so, been truly confirmed. Not yet, but yes, yes. it has. So the one thing that we, that I, like, I think I was the one who was like, no, clearly this is not the way, is I was convinced that he knew he was a Klingon, but now I'm pretty sure that if, like, if this is the play, and it's probably the play that he does not know, and he is slowly remembering as he's been exposed to Lorel again. Yeah, that, like, he gets very explicit flashbacks of what are, uh, like, appear to be torture, but are very clearly him being surgically ordered to become a oh, human. They- <laughs> Like, it could be construed that way. To be fair, it is not clear that that's what that is. It is extremely clear. It comes up and flashes text on screen that says, Ash Tyler is Vok. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's very, it's pretty obvious. And then there's also, like, in part of that, like, it makes explicit the thing that he has been hinting at, which is that uh, uh, Lorel has been sexually assaulting him when he was in captivity. Though Vok and Lorel were basically tight enough to be, like, you know, lovers or whatever while they were doing whatever they were doing. So maybe he's just remembering that. Or maybe she also was like, well, now that you're mind wiped, I guess I can sleep with you because you're not the torch bearer anymore. Uh, 
Yep. It's old. whatever it is. It's a mess, and uh, we see Klingon yeah. titty, and it's it's all disturbing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, uh, the, the way that the episode, like, handles Ash's, uh, trauma is, like, really well done. Uh, I worry about where it's gonna go in the future if that was all just, a, like, a shield for the eventual twist of he's Vok, but I don't think they're gonna do that, because they've been very good about how, like, his PTSD, like, moment of going to shock is, like, really thoughtfully handled. Uh, his scene with Burnham at the end where he admits that, like, this is how I had to survive, and I'm technically complicit in it, but I don't regret it, and I have, like, it's fucked me up, and I need help is very good. Like, it's just a messy situation, and he's very sad and very traumatized, and uh, he has, he now has um, uh, Burnham to open up about it. Because we talked about how uh, Ash's, Ty uh, Ash's Tyler, Ash Tyler's character doesn't make much sense as what those two offer in a relationship, because Ash Tyler's such a blank slate, and how clearly he is a very traumatized person and that's like the connection but he needs to open up about it for the for that to actually be like a connection that we can make as the audience and they do that fully this episode ash tyler became a real person in this very sad way oh that boy's been through a lot even if he's not real he's been through a lot well yeah you get the sense now that if he does remember that he is valk at some point he might not actually want to be valk by the time he gets there mm -hmm. um also uh, Admiral Cornwell actually gets to be a psychiatrist in a way that no one's been a psychiatrist in Star Trek ever. I know. Not even like, the multiple psychiatrists. Like, she actually gets to talk him through his trauma, and, like, when he's, like, res like when he's talking to Burnham at the end, he's, like, doing, like, a pressure point thing with his hand. I don't know if you noticed that. That was very much, like, I need to recenter on this moment. Um, yeah. Like, it's really good. The way that she talks him down is really neat. Uh, it... It's almost as if these people worked on a series that was all about psychiatry. Almost. 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 <laughs> uh, commander Bur or I guess she's not a commander anymore, but Michael Burnham. Specialist Burnham. Specialist Burnham fights Cole on the bridge of a Klingon ship, and it's amazing. He he takes, he's like picking his teeth with Captain Georgiou's com badge, which is also dog tags, which is a brilliant touch, and it's amazing. And he slaps it to his like Klingon armor, and is like, if you think you can have this, come and get it. And she comes and gets it, and it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so the thing about this episode is that like, it's basically not very much happens, but it's incredibly tense because they have three of these bulls in the air at once. They have uh, Cole and Burnham fighting and this mission trying to be completed. Uh, they have Ash Tyler realizing he's Vox slash having these trauma flashbacks in the, the hold with Laurel. And you're like, wait, is he going to... like? Because the way they play that, he could totally suddenly realize and like murder Cornwell by the end of that scene. That is a way that could have gone. Uh, and they know that that's a possibility. And they also have the ship flying around doing the 133 jumps while Stamets is getting his brain destroyed. So you've got like three incredibly tense situations going on waiting for the other shoe to drop uh and in the middle of all that like while things are at a very bad moment um burnham decides the only way to stall for time is to challenge the leader of this klingon ship that i have infiltrated to a battle oh it's so fucking good so uh one of the things that happens in this episode is that she when she's on the bridge she pulls out her communicator which op works as a universal translator also which like obviously it would have to do that in like the purview of like the original series or whatnot but it's really neat to see it just work like that and so you get the klingons speaking english and uh what like seeing these klingons just like talking english like everyone does in all the other star treks i feel like immediately makes me just be like oh right klingons i remember klingons yeah, they're just having conversations. It's it's weird because, um, the, the uh, like a Cole has a line basically like we well, yeah, no, translator. So, so no, what what happens is she uh, when she comes out, she's like holding up her weapon or whatever, and he's like, "Oh, you you speak Klingon very well," and he's like, "This is technology that allows us to communicate," and he's like, "That's technology that's here to eradicate our culture." Yep, uh, which isn't like incorrect. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's really not incorrect, and that's why I talked about Undiscovered Country, because Undiscovered Country has, like, this very awkward dinner scene where the Klingons and Starfleet are having dinner, and, uh, like, I think it's Kirk says something is just human nature, and the daughter of the Klingon Chancellor is like, how could you say something so racist? Like, just outright racist. Like, come yeah. on! Uh, it's, uh, it's good. It's good. Uh, going back to the themes of, uh, you know, the uh, Federation is just... Uh, colonialism which it is uh, it is you have, you have to accept that if you're writing star trek you can't ignore yeah no that like fact. like you can you can describe it as benign colonialism all you want and like i kind of i guess that's kind of where i fall where it's like like 
I would like to live in a place where there's no money. Yep. Um, even if it means that everybody's culture and identity gets watered down a little bit, but I understand that like the Klingons definitely aren't going to buy into that. Yeah. It's uh it's a good like point of um, like tension here. And I'm glad they haven't like Cole's just an evil villain and he exists to get owned uh, in this mid period of the season while everyone's uh, in other like places of the chessboard. Uh, but I'm glad that he was able to like, b- do things other than just be evil and uh give proper points and she's like lecturing him on like you took this ship after someone else united the houses but then you like took command stole this you've got no honor i'm gonna challenge you to a battle and call your bluff which is the only move anyone has on klingons at any time in all of star trek yep and to be fair, in like the evil Klingons of later Star Treks would not fall for that. They would be like, no, I'm not going to fight you. But That's because true. he is a Klingon of this era, he actually does believe in honor in a way that like later Klingons talk about honor a lot, but don't actually seem to believe in it much anymore. Oh, the Klingon stuff in DS9 is good. Yep. Uh, but yeah, she she holds her own against Cole, and it makes zero sense that she would be able to fight him off. But it's awesome. There's a moment where he like has her in a grab, and is he? She is she is lost. She has lost the fight at this point. He has grabbed her. He is like a seconds away from being able to stab her through the face. But instead, what he does is push her onto the wall and try to stab her so she can roll out the way. It's very television fighting. Yep. Uh, so meanwhile, we have. Uh, the whole thing with Captain Lorca, where Lorca early on talks to Stamets and is like, because uh, they they start talking about like things might be wrong with him because of his jumps, right? Yes. Uh, he... well, no, so he is told in a very hilarious bit of plotting, which I liked a lot. He is like told to go to the doctor and have a full examination in order to show why he can't get in the thing, because like to give them a fake excuse for why they can't jump right now. Uh, yes. Little does Lorca know, uh, Stamets' mind has been being destroyed by the spore network of mushrooms. His mushroom communion has been opening his mind. Uh, and this comes out as he is... um examined by uh uh dr colbert by dr colbert and then tilly says oh i'm so glad he's so finally no, told what, you about the side it's effects. not it's not about that's before that like all they say is that he's got weird weight matter activity yep. but then that's enough for Lorca to be like well i this is clearly putting you at risk and even though you say you don't have any side effects let me show you the benefits of what we're doing and he shows them the is this map he's made of all the jumps that stamets has made so far and that it's not just mapping this galaxy, but the mycelium network might actually unite different universes together. And with these jumps, they might be able, after the war, to use this to f- truly get to the final frontier, which is outside this universe, into new universes. And it's enough to make Stamets go, yes, I will sign up for your 133 jumps, even though it will probably kill me. I have to I have to gather the information to allow us to cross the boundaries between universes well, and really a, explore. It's a really good, like, Lorca move, because Lorca does this a lot where Lorca is here to win the war and uh, achieve his nefarious ends. Um, but he has this moment of, like, I care about science. I've got this thing, like... If you just wanted to win the war, I understand why you'd be hesitant, but this is a benefit to us like in a very permanent, lasting way. We all have mapped out the multiverse, and that's thanks to you, Stamets. Do the 133 jumps, and he does. And then there's, and so after all that, and Stamets is like really wiped out and he's like, no more, I have to quit. There's a scene where like they're in the shuttle bay and it's one of the most amazing scenes in the world. And like they, uh, on Twitter, some of the producers are talking about how like, no, they actually fought for the scene because there's no reason this scene, scene should be taking place in like the open wind, like giant, like vacuum force field of the shuttle bay of the discovery, but it is, and it's beautiful. And so Stamets is just staring at the planets in space and Lorca comes up and is like, they wanted to give me a medal. I told him to give it to you. And he's like, oh, thank you. That's not necessary, sir. And he's like, we're heading back to the star base. And he's like, well, I want out. And uh, I don't want to ever do a jump again. I need doctors to examine me. He's like, don't worry about it, son. I'll, we'll take the ship at warp back to the star base. It's fine. And then Stamets is like, no, no, no. Like, you've done so much. The least I can do is get everyone to shore leave quickly and do the jump. And uh, yeah, clearly Lorca knew exactly what he was doing. Lorca is so good at inspiring people to believe in him and then use them for his own ends. I know. He is he is uh, evil. But I don't know. I like Lorca now. His nebulous anti-hero evilness is... Well, he is clearly exactly what we said he was, is that he's yeah. a mirror universe person who found himself in his space and just decided to be the best Gabriel Lorca he could be in whatever universe he's in. Because he's, so he, he's doing the thing. He gets into the, like, ominous, something's about to go wrong. One day before retirement, gives Cole 
Lovely Kiss gets in the thing. Uh, and then they Lo- talk about going to see uh, La Boheme on the moon of the planet they're going they to. They talk about going to see La Boheme, which I know Rent is problematic, but it, uh, more to you, but we have affection for Rent from our younger years, and it was yep. very good. Uh, and then Lorca is, Lorca's in his chair and says, let's go home, and redirects the discovery into a like a coordinate that the computer does not recognize. Yep, it just says unknown coordinates, and uh, in this process, like um, Stamets just screams, "This has been too much for his brain. His brain is overwhelmed by the universes, and they end up in some space that no one knows." Yeah. Uh, the the cliffhanger is like very strange, as it's like, "Oh, what happens if you boldly go too far?" And they're like, "Where are we? We're lost in nowhere." And Anyone who's watched Star Trek or paid attention to this show and how every third episode ended with a shot of a mirror knows where they are. <laughs> they're in the mirror universe. There's still people who are like, what if this show is in the mirror universe and they're in like, now they're in the normal space. And I'm like, no, come on. What are you talking about? No, they're in the mirror universe. That literally doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yep. There's a mirror universe enterprise episode. <laughs> Uh, but also, like, the Terran Empire in the original series has been reigning for years and years and years. Like, it's not like they just randomly became the Terran Empire overnight, and before that they were just Starfleet hunky-dory. That would be really dumb to have a series just have an empire show up in, like, ten years. I don't know who yeah. would do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, what's the... Like, the idea that the uh, an entire galactic empire could rise and fall in a single person's lifetime doesn't make much sense to me, Jackson. It's really stupid. I don't know how that would sustain a franchise. If, I don't know how to take it seriously. Yeah, I don't know. Weird. <laughs> we get one right. We get one every week. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not even a quote. So, no. uh, that's I think that's kind of it for this episode. I mean, Laurel. Uh, so Ash Tyler does meet with Laurel in the brig, and she's like, "Soon." And as he like collapses and is all sad, and she's like, "Don't worry, I won't let anybody hurt you." Like clearly knowing who he is. Uh, oh, it's so creepy. Even though he doesn't, and that's great. Uh, I like Lorel's like adherence, just get wanting to get the fuck off Cole's ship. Also, <laughs> she fucking hates Cole. I I wonder yeah. which way they're gonna take Lorel. Um, I would like her to not be like irredeemably evil. Sure, but she has also in this episode like there is an explicit scene of a flashback of her like raping one of the main characters of the show. She that yeah, is a, no, I know. It's that's fucked up. That's the yep, line you no. cross in a characterization. So I don't yeah, know no, where they're gonna sure. take her. Yep. Uh, Cause yeah, I. God, man, Ash Tyler, my perfect fictional boy. <laughs> I will protect yep. him. Man. So uh, I guess that kind of just leaves like odds and ends around the episode. One of the things I talked to you about that I really liked is when Discovery fires on the Klingon ship, uh, like because this show has a budget like photon torpedoes do actual damage like there's actual explosions and it's cool like it makes space battles feel dangerous in a way that like the tv shows almost never do and the, like the movies do because they're willing to blow up a ship at the drop of the hat because it looks cool but on the shows it's always like oh it hits the shields and there's a flash or maybe there's some light damage and it's fine like a console explodes then they say repairs crews to deck 18 or something uh, but there's not like there's not like actual structural damage happening to the outside of their ships like uh, like in the way that it happens to the Sarkovka's ship in this episode. Yeah, like the most you get is the consoles exploding and people and extras falling over. Yeah, uh, and like you get like the moments it does happen are very cool. Like the opening of DS Nine where the ship that Cisco's on gets fucked up is like very startling, but it only happens because it's the opening of a show. They can't do that. But now it's 2017, and television is such that you can just do that in a show because it's all like serialized, and they're not gonna they're not afraid to like fuck things up. Also, they spend a lot of money on this show. I know, and that's an entire very expensive set that is just gone. That that yeah. uh. Sarkovka's they were so proud set? of it and like it looked so cool that i just assumed it would be like one of the main sets of this entire show and now it's just gone yeah no that's that's i mean i'm assuming at some point there will be another klingon ship with like that set redressed somehow as like a different bridge maybe i who knows like that's the sarcophagus the sarcophagus ship seems so specific to like it was found hanging in space and belongs to like an even older klingon culture than the one that the klingons of this era exist in mm-hmm I just, I can't imagine that, like, they have a lot of ships hanging around that look like that, right? Yeah. No, no stuff, like, so this is obviously the best first nine episodes of any Star Trek show by, like, miles. 
Yes. Uh, but, like I, I would the only Star Trek I would like accept arguments for is the original series because that show had an exceptional first season because mm-hmm. they had the idea of what they were going to do and then just got the best writers to do it and then by season two and three they like ran out of like they started running out of money and stuff like season three in particular of TOS is not fondly remembered by anybody because just how shows were produced back then. Yep, but uh, just the the amount that has changed in nine episodes is crazy. It is a big show. I am so happy that this is what we got. Yep. That scene of um, the uh, ship of the dead blowing up and everyone on the bridge like watching it explode in slow motion is also very good. Because usually yeah. you get uh, the one effect shot where the ship blows up in like, a wide angle on the view screen uh, and everyone goes, target destroyed, and nods and carries on their day. Uh, but this moment where they all have to, like, in the beauty of just space have to realize that no thanks to our efforts we have fucking destroyed this entire thing and that's what we did that's what we were here to do and we did it and there's this really beautiful moment where um burnham like looks at it like what have i done has to decide whether she's okay with it and then silently realize that she is and smiles at saru happy she's alive it's very it's very good also, that sequence begins with Lorca dosing both of his eyes so he can walk right up to the view screen and watch the entire thing. <laughs> so you have Burnham going, oh, am I okay with what I have done? And deciding yes. And then you have Lorca getting his eyes in perfect condition so he can just watch the- watch it happen. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's a good show. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a really good show. Uh, I like that they... So they're like... They're like away team vests have lights on them, and why in TNG are they just carrying around palm lights at this point? If they could just do that, that's they my do. Take. <laughs> they have like torches on their vests, which is clearly it's really smart they're really nice. Yeah, I mean those yeah. away team vests look very nice. It like compared to mm, no the DS9 vests look fine. It's just I hate them in first contact. I just fucking hate Picard wearing the the, the, yeah, the vests. No, aren't it's bad. bad. I just it's hate a bad Picard look. wearing them. Yep. I hate that one shot of Picard and Data in the vests. Whenever Picard is not wearing his normal TNG uniform, it's bad. Yep. Velour jacket, bad. <laughs> oh, who? TNG movies, uh, uniform, bad. Given all the hot takes today. Yep. That time where he has a toupee and is wearing the TOS uniform, good, but hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic days. Yep. Uh, do we have any more like final points before we want to go into questions? No, I don't. I, I don't think so. I'm really excited. I'm glad we only have to wait six weeks for more of this. Uh, we had talked last night a bit about how, like, this was like originally the season was going to break an episode earlier, and it was like, was that originally going to be the cliffhanger of, oh, the Klingons are coming to Pavo, and they changed it to, oh, now we're in the mirror universe, and like, this is such a bolder, better cliffhanger. Even though, it, like, it could have also totally worked as the setup for what the second half of the season's about. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. glad they just went with this being the spectacular finale of this show. I, I think this was always, des- like, my read on this episode is it feels like it's designed to be the end of it. Uh, like, I don't think last episode would have been an exciting season break in the way that this is. Like, this feels like mm-hmm. a finale. But it also feels like a premiere in cool ways. I don't know. I don't know enough about television scheduling. I assume a lot of that decisions came down to, like, effect schedules. Because um, yeah. they definitely changed. Uh, it was It was eight and... Seven, it was eight episodes of the first block for a long time and then yes. i suddenly looked and was like wait there's an extra week how did that happen yeah uh, maybe it went to nine nine and six so clearly there was a discussion about this and um yep. it's yeah this this was an incredible it is in such a cooler place than oh shit the klingons are coming because they're they're in the mirror universe what's gonna happen yep. Uh, the thing that I floated to you that was interesting is what state is the thing are things going to be like when they come back? Because they had like the program that allows them to see past Klingon cloaks, but they like in theory they might not have actually been able to send that out before they got thrown into a different universe. Like that was not made clear in that well, yeah, episode. Yeah, they trans. They were like, "I'm transmitting it." I would have to go back and look at the line. They they said that they're compiling the program. It will take eleven hours to get it ready to be disseminated, and then we'll get back to you when we do that. Oh, so they don't have it. But but that was like when Lorca was talking to the Vulcan uh, Admiral. So who knows when that was between then and when they jumped. Oh, right. Because that's like the day before. And then there's... Mm, yeah. yeah, you're right. That totally could... Okay. Because we have no idea then. Uh, I yep. think it's more interesting to have... Like, I think the least interesting way they could do 
is to have them come back and they don't have the magic technology so the klingons are winning again like that's but also it is it is inevitable that they do not have the technology to see past cloaks because that's the state of the universe in star trek they don't have the te- state of the technology to see past those cloaks I, I i don't i don't i don't buy it i don't know i think that's weird i don't know i i could see like the explanation being this rendered the klingons cloaks obsolete which is why klingons don't have cloaks usually I, I mean, they do by the time you get to, like, the movies. They just don't... Like, yeah, in TOS, Klingons don't have cloaks, but every other time they do. Yeah, but that's, that's like, the Romulan cloak. All right, we need to... I don't know. Who knows? This is a bit I am not into the lore on. I am not fully caught up, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, yeah, well, no, I don't know. We'll see. Um, I think something more interesting than they are getting destroyed by the Klingons is going to happen. I think there's going to be radical changes in the status quo of that uh, world when they come back. Yep. Who are who is in charge of the Klingons? What is happening? There's a, 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 a huge power vacuums. Yep. David Warner. I'm very excited. David Warner's in charge of the Klingons. Yes, he's he Chancellor in Star Trek Six. Yep. Bring him back. <laughs> Yep, he's he's he is young enough to play a Klingon still. He's in, only in his seventies. He's probably fine. Yep. We should do these questions because we have three. Emails. Yes, and we have two tweets. We have two tweets. I have tweets. Yes. Okay. So from our friend Ryan comes the question: What brings you more joy, drunk tri- Tilly or high on mushroom Stamets? Oh, high on mushroom Stamets. I think I'm going to say Drunk Tilly. Like, it's a close call, but yeah. he wanted to commune with his mushrooms. <laughs> like, I it, I think it brings him more joy. <laughs> uh, it's, it's specifically that Drunk Tilly is still willing to, like, go analyze a giant space whale in her party outfit that makes Drunk Tilly the best. Oh, you're not wrong. You're not yep. wrong. <laughs> They're both really good. Because yep. High on Mushroom Stamets, like, takes Burnham and, like, dances with her in order to yeah, like, no, see it's the really truth good. of herself. Yeah, no, it's uh, this is a fantastic show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, from our friend Alan comes the question, how will people remember Discovery Season 1 in 10 years? If it gets a lot of seasons, do you think it'll resemble what the way it is now down the line, or will it shift drastically like other shows did? Hmm. That is a good question. I think it'll be remembered as very good, because it is good. Um, I hope that uh, it'll be remembered as, like, the starting point for what modern Star Trek looks like. Because if... if uh, Discovery runs for a long time, then we're just Star Trek's back. We're going to have some more Trek. It's going to be good. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. I, I think it'll be good. I think the show will change a bunch. They, the way they are talking about season two, they like gave that announcement saying they knew what they wanted to do with it. So I'm assuming yep. season two is a whole different focus and not like a Klingon war situation. Yeah. Uh, I assume that it will be known as a Star Trek that really hit the ground hard and fast in what it was about. And thus, like, the Star Trekness took time to settle in. I think the fans will always be like, oh, that first season didn't really feel like Star Trek, but season two really found the ball, even though it's clearly been Star Trek since like season, it was like episode three of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think the fandom will come around, but keep claiming that season one, it doesn't feel like real Star Trek, even though they're clearly wrong. And there'll be people like me and Jackson to tell you that for the end of time. Yeah. I could also see a world where like season one is seen as the good version of the show and season two is bad. I don't know. I think what they, I think in a world where this is really successful, they slow, like, because they don't have to tell such a huge giant arc with like, maybe this is the only thing we get to tell. We might as well swing the fences. They can do more of those one-off episodes. Like the time where Harry Mudd got an Andorian time crystal suit and tried to take over the ship like 57 times. Oh, right. Yeah, I guess, yes. In this episode, in this season, we've already had like ridiculous, just one-off Star Trek episodes. It's going to be a good journey. God, I'm ready. Yeah. We have a couple more uh, questions. Yeah, we have uh, emails. Yeah, we have emails. If you also send us an email, you can send it to podcast at normapping.com. You can. Uh, we have one um, from our friend Crass that just, just wanted to point out that the uh, that the sarcophagus ship is a museum and a flagship and a mausoleum, and blowing it up is a huge blow to Klingon culture. To be fair, six months ago, they didn't even know that ship existed, so I'm sure the Klingons aren't too broken up about it. Uh, well, we'll see. People are broken up about something. No. Klingons, like, Cole is trying to exterminate the torchbearer's whispers. People yep. still care about that to Kuvma. 
Um, our friend uh, Chrissy uh, writes in and says that they haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but they really enjoyed the podcast. Thank you. Uh, they mentioned that we are very. It's good to be, have people who are positive about Star Trek because they're watching it with they're watching it, or they have friends in real life that are like really negative about it, and uh, that's a shame. I can't imagine Star Trek coming back and being around someone who's like new Star Trek. I'll what stick is- with my old Star Trek. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's it's here. Go watch the fucking Orville, people. Ugh. Uh, and they ask the question, if you could visit any one place in the Star Trek universe, where would you go? Oh, that's such a hard question. Like, is the it? answer's the fucking Enterprise D is the problem. <laughs> is it? Is it? Is it? What? Is it? Is is it such a hard question? And is your choice is really the Enterprise D? I don't know. Like, it's the... Like, probably, it's the place that I watched on TV growing up. It's an incredibly cool ship. I want to be there. I want to see it. I don't know. Like, I don't really okay. think about places in the universe. Because they're usually just, like, one set and a table, <laughs> I don't often think of Star Trek places as, like, that's a place I'd really want to go. I, my answer, uh, I think, has always been I would like to go to TNG or early DS9 Kronos. I want to hang with the Klingons. Yeah, you would. <laughs> Yeah, no, of course I would. Of course you would. I would not. Yep. I don't think I'd handle that very well. Uh, I think Klingons are super cool. Like, uh, that episode where Riker does, like, the officer exchange program and just hangs on my Klingon ship for a while. I love that episode. I, I would want to do that. That sounds great. I love that there's an episode of TNG where the plot is, what if there was an officer exchange program with the Klingons? <laughs> it's a really good episode. It's very good. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, there's a lot of choices. That That's mine today. Uh, like, being on DS9 in general would be really cool. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I like Andoria. I like Andorians. I would like that. You mean Andor? Yes. <laughs> Andor, Andoria, whichever. Take yep. your pick. Nobody cares. Nobody knows. Uh, yeah, no, no one knows. And no one cares. Uh, all right, so we have some thoughts from Jen. Let me read this and see if there's actually a question here. <laughs> Uh, because Jen's is a little rambly and she apologized for it being rambly. Yep. As she said, she likes Captain Lorca because he's complicated and like, she's like, he's, I didn't expect to like him as much, but I do. And he's interesting and nuanced. And yep, that we've been all in on that. Uh, she mentioned that she appreciates that they didn't have the tragic gay relationship cliche. And uh, I guess I'm also glad considering it has been a shame that Star Trek has not had openly gay characters before this decade. And that's crazy. Yeah, for a series that is supposedly about uh, thinking of a future where the bigotry doesn't exist, the 2017 is the first gay relationship of Star Trek? Fuck off. Well, I mean, that's that's not true, because Beyond was lad, the year before. That was in Beyond, right? With Sulu? Oh, yeah, sure, fine. Yes, that was he walks year. off screen and goes and kisses his boyfriend, and then the boyfriend leaves. Like, Yeah, I know, <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, well, that's still only one year ago. Yep. Yeah, I know. I know. The point stands. Uh, yep. But no, I, these two, if anybody has plot armor in Star Trek, it's these two. Like, Stamets might have glowy eyes and might be a little crazy, but they're clearly going to end up together in some fashion. Oh, the power of love is going to 100% bring him back to, like, the real universe. You know this is true. Yep. It's going to be yeah. great. I can't uh, wait. And then we have one that just came in, and I have not read it yet. So let me look at this real fast. There's a new question that came in? Yeah. Ooh, um, live uh, recording. There it is hunter yep uh hunter mentions that cbs had been touting this as star trek but game of thrones and how much they had dreaded that idea and i knew that wasn't going to be the case because you can't make star trek game of thrones that's not even possible but Uh, obviously you have to say that as someone like an executive says we want star trek's a name and game of thrones is get makes a lot of money give us that and you nod and you say yes 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 but then you have harry mudd in a time loop uh yeah, Star Trek's already better than Game of Thrones. Like you didn't even have to change anything, and it's already true. So <laughs> you just nod and say you're doing that, and then yeah. make Star Trek, and no one notices. We have a lot of characters. All of them are complicated. It's like Game of Thrones, basically. Yep. I a hundred percent. If I like Twitter search quote DS Nine quote Game of Thrones, will her find a million people earnestly saying DS Nine is the Game of Thrones of Star Trek. Yep. Uh, Hunter also says they didn't have friends to talk about Star Trek, so they enjoy the episodes. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank uh, you. 
Man, so I grew up, part of the reason I was not like in the fandom is I grew up kind of like I watched Star Trek and then I didn't really have people who reinforced me loving Star Trek. And it's really nice to have people in your life that you can talk Star Trek with. If you don't have someone, find a friend who is willing to learn Star Trek and slowly expose them to all of Star Trek. That's what I'm doing with my partner. It's a great time. Yep. Uh, uh, Jackson I, was a baby who had only seen TNG and DS9 when we started. I, yeah, so I, I, well, no, I'd seen some Enterprise, but I had, um and, and some Voyager, uh, but uh I, oh, you meant after doing that, you meant, okay, I see what you mean. I was talking about as a kid, I watched TS9 and Voyager mostly and then some Enterprise with my dad, but then my dad left. So I stopped watching Star Trek because I didn't know what I was to talk about. Um, yeah, I, I just remember at one point you were not all in on Star Trek in the way that we are now all in on Star Trek all the time. Yeah, and then when I got to uni, I watched the TOS movies and then just sat down and watched TOS and DS9 in basically the space of three months. It, I did nothing. It was a very dark time in my life, but I did nothing but go to uni and watch Star Trek in the fucking tiny uni flat that I had. And that was how I spent my time. Uh, uh, the thing I've guys. discovered is that there are like there are so many different communities of people who enjoy Star Trek Online that you can yes. find the people who will be willing to talk about it with you, including Star Trek Online, if that's your poison. <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> oh, oh God, Lizzie sent us a cursed image. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, for a different podcast. We'll oh, talk about that next time we talk Star about Trek DS9 Online. Uh, but yes, no. Uh, feel free to email us or at me on Twitter if. if uh, I have too many followers on Twitter, which is me humble bragging, I guess. But it means it's like, I don't really check who's following me. So if you are want to talk about Star Trek, please feel free to at me. I, I'm very open to people talking about Star Trek with me. Like, yeah, random no, people I... yelling about video games in my direction, less so. Uh, but Star Trek, feel free to give any ats uh, I will accommodate if you're feeling lonely on the Star Trek talk. Yeah, no, 100%. I will also be down for that. Uh, I love all the... There outside of star trek into darkness there's no star trek i don't pretty much love so mm -hmm. even the bad star trek sometimes especially the bad star trek yep so that's, that's it, it for our questions jackson that's it for our questions that's it for discovery for that, chapter for now. one uh volume one of season one it's chapter i think the cbs app calls it season one chapter one i hate it i hate it i hate it so much mid-season breaks the walking yep. dead I was talking to you that this is the this is the first show I've watched that has a mid season break that happened as I was watching it. Yep. Because I don't watch a lot of new television. Oh, you didn't watch that Breaking Bad? No, I didn't. You did, right? Yeah, I did. Mad Men had se mid seasons, right? Uh, th I mean, those were less season breaks and more just the final season was two seasons that were half as long. Oh, Harry Potter. Yeah, it was very dumb. The spoilers, Hobbit. Spoilers for Breaking Bad. One funny anecdote before we end is I told you about the end of the second, the first half of uh the final season of Breaking Bad is the cliffhanger. There is uh the cop friend finally finds out who. Oh, Walter's right. Doing that, I was like, I don't remember you telling mind. me this at all. And yeah, no. How is that? How did that take so long? For, God. TV's bad. Star Trek's good. Please always watch Star Trek. Jackson, plug our other stuff. All right. We have many, many, many shows uh, on abnormalmapping.com. That is our website. We have Abnormal Mapping. That is a game club at thebestgame.club. Uh, we talk about video games free of the discourse. It's good. You also talk about video games in a new podcast that is launching at soon. It's up. It's up. It's not on iTunes, but if you go to abnormalmapping.com or and look for it, or if you just go to abnormalmapping.com slash novel, not new, you will find novel not new yes. a new visual novel game club that i am doing with uh friends of the show colin and jen which is uh, gonna be monthly and uh is exciting because it's a podcast i don't host for once yes it's gonna be very fun uh that is on site launching soon you can subscribe to it on itunes as soon as that's up uh oh I'd... you can just put the rss feed into your thing and have it on your phone like i did that's true uh yeah. i am on the amory score with molly there's an episode of that coming this thursday it is a show where we listen to and read the Coheed and Cambria uh, fiction. It's very, very dumb. It's a good time. Um, yep. uh, we also do The Great Gundam Project, which is two episodes of Gundam every week. It's oh, Gundam's good. Gundam's a good, fun show. It is... I guess similar to Discovery sometimes, even though it's no, mostly about... No, no, it's not. No, it's not. Don't don't, don't lie to the people. <laughs> if you want a different idea of what sci-fi war can look like, please check out The Great Gundam Project. Support us. Patreon.com slash Abnormal Mapping for $1 will get you those episodes. Uh, they're good, but in like a very different way that yes. cannot be translated to Star Trek. Uh, there are some moments, but yes. War is hell everywhere is the, the true thing. But war is especially hell in Gundam. 
Uh, is that it? Do we have any new things? Fireside Friends, go no, check that out. I mean, out. we have Fireside Friends. Please check out FiresideFriends.net for uh, Ryan and Alan's good show about media. Uh, they don't really have like a neat purview of what they're about in a way that all our podcasts tend to do but they're about it's friends. a good show they're about friends yeah. they have guests oh, they are the guest show more than us we don't really do as many guests yeah. as hard. If, if our if our shows are like the type a shows theirs are the very laid back. like it's like if yeah. you just want to have a good time with your friends go check out fireside friends if you want to learn something but be stressed about it please listen to us oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not selling ourselves shit <laughs> We made Whatever. the wrong choice. We chose the wrong when thing. I'm, when I'm looking for a podcast, I often say to myself, I would like to learn something but be mildly stressed about it. So well, I'm glad that I think we that are, says a lot about who I am. I'm glad that we're catering to the market of people who wish to be mildly stressed. If people want to come back next month, we are covering, again, as I said, Desperate Hours, the first Discovery novel by David Mack. We are covering two episodes of the original series. We are covering The Cage, which is the original pilot. Uh, it's on Netflix and stuff. It's just the first one. You can find it real easy. And we are covering Dagger of the Mind, which is like episode 10, I think, of the first season of TN or TOS. Uh, you can find those wherever fine Star Trek is streaming or on your Blu-rays or whatever. If you still have the CBS app and didn't cancel it like I did, they're on there because they have all the Star Trek. Uh, and we will be back with actual episodes of Discovery in January when the show returns. Yep. See you out there. You're not allowed to do that, Jackson. Don't, 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 don't. Now you've got to do it, and I've already stolen the, the thunder. You're the worst. You're the worst. The Orville. No. No, I'm not going to do it.